Welcome to this series of study on biblical salvation. Thank you for taking the time to absorb this essential information if we're going to understand biblical salvation. Now, I say biblical salvation in contrast to the teaching of salvation that is championed by most in Christianity today. And this contrast will be recurring, a recurring theme as we go along. This is not to throw negativity on, on others. Rather, this is to reveal truth. And truth is what we're trying to reveal, we're trying to get to, we're trying to understand, trying to, to grab hold of. And here's the thing about truth, it just is. Truth doesn't care if we know it or not. Truth doesn't look around to see who's following it. Truth is just an unstoppable force. And, and no matter what people say or what we believe, it doesn't make something true or not. It doesn't change the truth. It's up to us to discover what truth is. And biblical truth is the only thing that can save us. So truth is valuable. It's a treasure that we can find. And we're not going to accept anything at, at face value. That's the mistake that, that so many make. Some great person or organization claims something to be true, and but, but we can't be lazy if we're seekers of truth. We investigate. We look at it from every angle. We, we handle it. We prove or disprove the claim. There's no room for being lazy when our soul is at stake. It takes work. And so thank you again for uh, taking the time to, to go through these, these lessons in a, in a search for truth. The Bible is an amazing book. Uh, it's unique among all the books that have ever been written. It's the only one with this claim. It was authored by God himself. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul was writing to a young man named Timothy, and he says this. He told them that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, and for instruction or training in righteousness. And Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, says, For prophecy, that's the anointed word of God, never had its origin in the human will. This Bible, its origins are not from the will of men and women, but prophets, though human, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So even though the scriptures were penned, by men. Those men were directly moved on by the Spirit of God and wrote as they were carried along. So the Bible, though penned by many, really only has one author. The Bible is the only book that we have that was written by God himself. So the Bible, this Word of God, is an amazing gift to, to mankind, and it's up to us to, the Bible says, it says to rightly divide it is so important, to handle it uh, in, a, in a serious and a sober manner and to approach it that way. The Bible is amazing in that it has in it a system of checks and balances that are built into it. This means that we don't have to guess what the Bible means when it says something, but we can compare it with other verses and we can establish a context for either for, for narrowing the scope of what it says. And it's got checks and balances. And so if we will let the Bible, the Bible will interpret itself. We don't have to guess what it means. This brings us to yet another important point in biblical study. We can't approach God with a pre-held belief system. We'll look at the scripture with colored glasses and we'll only see what we already believe. Rather, we've got to love this word of God. We've got to trust this word of God, to have faith in the God that wrote it and to let it shape us. It's a mistake to try and, and force the word into, into our mold. And here are some red flags that indicate possible mistakes or possible false doctrine. Number one, when anyone attempts to explain away the scriptures. If you have to remove some verses or, or to move some verses out of the way to make your doctrine work, then something is wrong. We're missing something along the way because the Bible isn't structured that way. You're removing one of those safety guards that are in there for correctly interpreting it. There's greater truth to be found if, if you come across two scriptures that don't agree because truth will bring the word of God into agreement. And that's the way it's set up. And it, really, it's an amazing book. And number two, if someone tries to redefine scripture, and what I mean, they say, well, that's what they said, but what they really meant 
is this. And if we're trying to twist or redefine scriptures, then, then that should be a red flag. Number three, attributing certain verses to a group of people. I hear so many times, well, that was just for the Jews or that was just for, for that time. But the Bible itself doesn't say this was just for the Jews or this was a certain time. You can't uh, attribute it to a particular group, but it doesn't apply to me. Um, the blood of Jesus brought a new covenant with God a new relationship, a new way of doing things versus that old covenant or what we call the, the Old Testament. This New Testament, there's a, there's a book in the New Testament called the Book of Hebrews. And the Bible itself puts the Old Testament into context of the New Testament. So if there's any verses to be explained away or to shed new light on, the Bible does it itself, not us. So where any scripture needs to be put in a certain context, the Bible itself will do the explaining. Otherwise, every chapter, every verse, every line in the book is for us today. With those things in mind, by way of introduction, the first point I'd like to make is that God is serious about his word. There are so many verses that speak to this, and we don't have time to go over them. The, the, the sessions would go on and on and on and on if we tried to be exhaustive. But we can make the point that God sometimes speaks generically in, in broad terms, and then sometimes he speaks specifically. And here's the, the mistake I see in mainstream Christianity, that they have a tendency to take generic statements and then try to apply them as if they are specific and then ignore the specific scriptures altogether because they may be offensive or because they may alienate too many. Rather than having respect to the word of God, they have respect to trying to draw a crowd. But truth, it doesn't work that way, and the word of God doesn't work that way. We can't be concerned with offense or alienating people in our search for truth. What we should be concerned about is offending God. What we should be concerned about is alienating ourselves from him and having regard and respect to him as we approach his word and not mishandle it for the sake of a crowd. Our loyalties, they lie not with denomination, not with organization, not with what grandma believed or grandpa believed, not even what, what mom and dad believe. Our loyalty must lie with the word of God itself. And this is how serious God is about this. In Matthew chapter 10, beginning of verse 34, I'm reading from the New King James Version, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, because he came to bring truth. He says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And those are very sobering words. And, but it brings to mind the seriousness that God has. We are to forsake all others in our search for the truth and be willing to do that. This is what truth does. It may alienate us from others, but it will bring us into companionship with the one who created us. We've got to love biblical truth more than anything else in this whole world. If we will love truth and if we will stand with Jesus, then God will work his wonderful works in our life. And that's what we're after. God will reach for the moms and dads. If we stand with Jesus, God will reach for the moms and dads. And God will reach for the, the sons and daughters. We've got to trust the Lord. And that's the point I wanted to make. Very serious about approaching this, but trust God and that he'll work through this truth. Biblical truth is not generic but rather it is very specific. Most people say, and you hear in the ranks of Christianity, just believe. And generically that is true, but how to believe has very specific elements to it. Exposing those specifics is the purpose of this series of, of lessons. Here's what we will find as we go along. There is not one single instance of someone being led to salvation in the Bible with this message just believe, as if salvation is just simply some part of uh, uh, an internal or mental ascent or even an external confession by itself. Listen to this very important statement. 
Modern mainstream Christianity is rooted in a salvation doctrine that originated in the 1400s during the Reformation movement that was begun by Martin Luther. In the 1400s, they returned to a more biblical doctrinal position than the, than the medieval Catholic doctrines, but they didn't reform all the way back to biblical salvation. Martin Luther just replaced one form of philosophy with, with another one. And Christianity is not a philosophy. The Bible is a declaration. This is what God says. It is a declaration. God speaks with an exclamation mark, not a question mark. God does not suggest. He declares what truth is, and it's our job to follow after and obey this truth. Obeying his word is the most transformatively powerful thing that a person can do. It will change our life from the core of our very being, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. And we'll talk about all of these things in more detail about how philosophy first made its way into the church and, and how that led to a, an open door of false doctrine and a government hijacking uh, the Christian movement in the 300s AD. And it took a thousand years for a failed reformation to take place. And we'll, we'll have a little history lesson on, on the way. A few verses in, in bringing this to a close and making the point of this introduction that God is serious about his word. Matthew ch chapter 7, verse 13, beginning there, NIV. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So number one, if the gate is small and the road is narrow, and if God expects us to discern this small and narrow way, then it must, by definition, be very well defined. If he expects us to find it in this narrow way, it's got to be very specific in what he wants us to do and how he wants us to walk. It's not broad, it's not wide, therefore it's not generic in nature, it's very specific in nature. It's not just believe, as we will see, but there is a way to believe that is very specific to God. Number two, it says only a few find it. Why? Not because it's hard to find, but because people are not willing to conform to the specifics of the Word of God. As the specifics are exposed in this study, as we continue, we'll go back to this principle again and again. It's specific. And as we expose these specifics, you'll have a decision to make again and again. Your response to the word of God will be the answer to the question, are you willing to walk the road that leads to life? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, NIV, it says, Paul, speaking of the last days, he told Timothy that there, there would be a form of godliness in the earth, but it would deny the power. He's telling him, about what God had revealed about the last days, that there would be a form of godliness in the earth, but it would deny the power to save the soul. There would be something that looks like church, something that sounds like church, something that feels like church, that does churchy things, but would, would not walk specifically enough to be saved. Godly in form only, but the form of it is not good enough. Again, the Bible is thus saith the Lord, not thus suggests the Lord. Again, Christianity is not a philosophy, it's a command. And there's a phrase that, that, gives, that alarms me every time I hear it, uh, and that's the claim that something is biblically based. Oh, it's biblically based. Well, a biblically based church, my goodness. They're saying we use Bible language and we use Bible concepts, but we kind of use and inform our own belief system. It doesn't work that way. If a church is just based on the Bible, then run from that church as fast as you can because Paul said in that very next phrase, have nothing to do with him. When it comes to truth, either it is or it isn't, and there isn't a whole lot of room for deviation. The last verse for this session is perhaps one of the most startling verses in the New Testament, and it really uh, speaks to checking ourselves about what we hold to be true. Because what we believe does not make a thing true or not. We don't define what is true. We discover what's true. What we believe has absolutely nothing to do with truth. Apart from what is specifically written in the word of God. We discover it. We don't define it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Jesus is speaking to uh, the disciples. And he says, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and, and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. They were calling Jesus Lord and they were doing churchy things. They were preaching in the name of Jesus. They were driving out demons. The genuine miracles were happening. But Jesus said, I never knew you. Now, we want all those things in our church. Those are signs of a healthy church, but those things do not indicate God's approval. All those things were biblical things, but what Jesus is saying is that even though they were doing those generic things, those churchy things, there were some specifics that they were not doing. And when they stood before the Lord, even though they had done all those things, Jesus said, I never really knew you. Depart from me workers of iniquity. That's a very sobering passage that tells us that God is so very serious about his words that we can't play church. But this is a serious and a sober thing. It also tells us that God will not sacrifice his truth for the sake of a soul. God loves us all very much, so much that he went to Calvary for us, but he will not sacrifice truth in the process. So please follow through with this series of lessons. I'll prove every statement that I've made so far. We're just getting started. So in the next lesson, we'll talk about the authority of the preaching of the apostles. And they are the ones that first proclaimed this New Testament salvation.